How would you explain who God is, the gospel, to a group of people who have no idea about anything about the Bible, who have no background, no understanding whatsoever? This is something that Paul is trying to do in our passage here this morning. See, we saw in our recent passages as Paul, this missionary, as he's going through now into Greece, throughout Europe, planting churches, growing uh, the church throughout Europe, he's often using a similar approach. We saw it last week. He usually goes into synagogues, speaks with the people there, and it's a pretty easy pitch because people in the synagogue have an idea of who the Messiah is. They have an understanding, so all he has to do is just explain that Jesus is this one who we've been waiting for, so we should worship and believe in him. And people either jump right on board or they chase him right out of town, as we saw last week. So he's gotten chased out of town once again and is now in Athens. He's waiting for Timothy. He's waiting for Silas. And he finds himself amongst the people who do not share these past convictions, who are in complete different grounds of religious belief. And how does he share the gospel to them here in Athens? Well, read along with me here in Acts chapter 16, uh, 17, starting in verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace, every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some, jo- some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus, the Arapagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. This is the word of the Lord. Imagine you are particularly hungry one morning and decide to just go to the grocery store to get breakfast. Where do you begin if you're hungry in the morning and looking for the first thing to eat? I guess you could go to what maybe some people think of for breakfast. Okay, the breakfast cereal aisle. Okay, great. You found the cereal. Okay, what do you eat then? Oh, there are a very bunch of different varieties of Captain Crunch, I suppose, or many generic varieties of the same brand of Captain Crunch, you know, Admiral, Admiral Crunchies or something like that, right? You could look there, maybe grab a box from there, or you could get rid of the whole idea of breakfast cereal itself. 
look for different options for eggs or some sort of breakfast meat, or defy all rules of orthodox breakfast eating and just buy ice cream, like butternut squash, crab legs. And you can say, well, no one has, this, had, has had this kind of breakfast before. This is 100% original me. You know, today in America, I think belief and religious faith often kind of feels like you're shopping for a breakfast cereal. There are so many options, so many ways of doing it, so many, I think, very orthodox and established ways of doing religion and belief. But I think more and more, I am seeing people more just take faith a la carte, right? Just picking and choosing and arranging however they wish their faith to turn out. Not going to any kind of conventional religion. Many people today have abandoned organized religion altogether. Creating and cultivating faiths, your own context, your own answers that you are looking for. I think the way we look for faith today, in this society especially, shows that it is still true. All people are looking for answers. All people have questions about their significance. The questions of how to live, of what to believe, of what to do. We're all looking for answers. But this impulse to just kind of select from a wide variety of options and pick and choose from different faiths and bring them together in your own original kind of faith shows that we only really like answers that we like. We don't really take the time to figure out what truth is, but we just all cultivate it to our own truth. But what it deep down reveals is a hunger. A hunger for belief, a hunger for answers. We are all hungry for that. And Paul in Athens sees that same kind of hunger for understanding, a hunger for truth, a hunger for maybe something new. Maybe because all the people in Athens have not found any answer that is truly satisfying, that truly brings truth to them. And it shows us, as in our passage reveals today, that because we are all created by God, that God is our common creator and our common father, we must all know how all other answers fall short. All other answers, all other attempts fall short of the truth. And that God still is close to us, even though our answers are still fall short. He is not so far out of reach that we cannot know him. And lastly, because he does reveal himself through Jesus Christ, because of that we are so clearly assured of life and eternal life. First, let's look at all these other answers that Paul is encountering here in Athens. He's walking through Athens and he is so incredibly shocked. He is disturbed by this Athenian idolatry. In verse 16, it says, while he was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him. So he saw that the city was full of idols. He's walking through the marketplace, sees idols being sold everywhere. He looks up on the hills and sees temples to gods and idols. It seems that in Athens, the whole economy, the whole way of life is built around this cultic worship of gods and idols. Are you hungry? Do you want some some meat? Well, the meat you find is probably meat that's been sacrificed to an idol. You're looking for someone to hook up with. There are temple prostitutes to visit that you can find your pleasure through that. You're looking for a promise of of good fortune, uh, a good way of knowing that you have insurance from evil, insurance from bad things. Well, the insurance salesmen in Athens are nothing more than idols themselves. There's an idol still for that, for every need, for every pleasure, for every desire, for every question in Athens. There's a different idol, a different God to point you towards. It doesn't seem like we have that kind of proliferation of idols today in our society, do we? I had, uh, it reminds me of a trip I took uh, for a wedding Got a sneeze coming. It's going to come out at some point. Or maybe if I just name the sneeze, it won't come. Okay, we'll see. All right, it's past now. Taking it back then for a second. I was on a trip for a wedding a couple uh, years ago to Las Vegas. It seems almost perhaps cliche to point at Las Vegas as this just kind of, you know, peak of American idolatry. But it was very apparent to me as soon as you step off the plane, right? 
As soon as you get off the plane, you're walking through the terminal, and what you see are slot machines already everywhere. Giant screen TVs as you get to baggage claim that are constantly advertising on an endless loop. All these promises that this city can offer you. This promise of the idol of, of youth and vitality and energy because all the people in all these advertisements, of course, are young, energetic, attractive, and beautiful. And this will be you if you're here. You'll, you'll meet someone like this while you're here and stay with that energy and youthfulness. And while you're here, what else do you get? This money, idol of wealth and success and enjoyment and that money what does it do but allows you to spend it on your passions your pleasures brings you all these ways of entertainment all these new experiences that are all awaiting you outside of baggage claim constant promises of these idols and it, it just kind of made me feel similar i suppose to how paul was feeling of like look at all these promises of things that we're all searching for, and it's a promise of if you just worship at the altar of youth and entertainment and pleasure, you will have all joy and hope. In the same way, Paul was stirred by how godless and idle full, godless and idle full this whole city seems to be. It reveals something I think very true about human sin. Full nature, that human sinful nature, so to speak, John Calvin wrote, is a perpetual factory of idols. By our sinful nature, we are on this assembly line constantly. Everything we see around us, we're taking onto the assembly line and just putting together idols to worship. Anything that we enjoy or desire in this life, we can so easily turn into something that our heart wants to worship. What are things that your factory has been churning out recently? Because so often we'll turn towards other people, our relationships as, as hopes for, this will complete me. Or once I, I get this job figured out, that will complete me. Once I reach this level of success and status, this will complete me. What are you saying today, once I have this completely put together, then I am complete? I think you might be identifying there an idol. If it's anything but what God's word has guided us to believe, if, if it's anything other than the fullness and the fellowship of your God, then you have just found out what your idol factory has been putting together recently. Our nature is a perpetual factory of idols. We must always realize how similar we are to these Athenians here. So Paul decides to really take his, his message to the streets. He goes out into the marketplace and is encountering people who think he's just some kind of babbler. Literally, they, they kind of picture him as someone who's just pulling together all these other ideas and stringing them together as if he's just overheard philosophers talking and just kind of trying to spit it back out. They, they can't understand what he's talking about because they've never encountered his system of faith and belief before. They don't know the origin of his thoughts, the origin of his philosophy. So they're curious what he's talking about, this Jesus person. He's talking about this resurrection. What are these things? These uh, two different groups of intellectuals uh, Luke mentions here are first the Epicureans. These Epicurean philosophers were very materialistic, very focused on the physical world, the here and now. And because of that, what pleasures can the here and now give me? What joys, what pleasure, what happiness, what hedonism I can experience in this world right now. That's my goal as a human being. The gods, well, they don't really quite interact with human affairs. They believe that the gods maybe created things, but they have nothing to do with human affairs right now. Very present, very materialistic. That's that kind of Las Vegas faith, I suppose, if you will. All that matters is right now. All that matters is what I can get and what I can enjoy. It is certainly in many ways a different form of philosophy that we still see here today. But also Stoics, different from them, but also philosophy that I think is very present in our cultures here today. The Stoics were determined on a focus of very rigorous rationalism. Of yes, there's great problems in the world and great pains and experience we can face, but if we remain rational and 
stoic, you know, unassailable and iron-faced and a strength of my own will. I can battle through everything because I am master of my own fate. I'm the captain of my ship, and if I just stay rational and reasonable and become unhindered by all these pleasures and things of the world that the Epicureans are talking about, if I just stay devoted to reason, then I can, I can succeed. They also had more of a kind of a pantheistic view of God, of a world, so this soul, this logos that created things, but not that there was this kind of personal religious relationship you could enter into. Stoicism very much in our culture today. I kind of chuckle when I hear about like Sigma grind set. It's essentially just reheated, repackaged stoicism of just, yeah, just focus and, and grind and don't be in, hindered by other things. It's stoicism. It's been around for thousands of years again. And neither, the, what is amazing with these intellectuals of the Epicureans and the Stoics, Paul's here to tell them, you can't actually get to the true answer with these things. Your ways of belief and interpreting the world still fail in their own way because even they confess a kind of agnosticism. He sees the way their altars are set up and he says, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. What does he mean by that? Is that he sees all these altars, even an altar to an unknown God and realizes, okay, that really Sets it off. A lot of people disagree, like, what is the tone or intent in Paul's words? Very religious. If some people think he's being really sarcastic or really tongue-in-cheek or kind of poking fun at them. Because the amount of idols they have reveal this kind of lack of seriousness of faith. They have idols everywhere, so okay, they must be really religious, right? But how seriously do they understand these things? I mean, imagine if you came to someone's house and you saw they had a cross, a Christian cross on their mantelpiece, and then maybe a statue of Vishnu under that. They had a, a Star of David keychain around their neck and a, um, a, a Quran open on the coffee table and a Buddha statue. You might feel like, wow, you're really into religions, aren't you? You're pretty religious. But which one? <laughs> or just what you like from each one of those? How religious can you really be if you're just kind of pulling in everything as if, let me just cover all my bases and make sure whichever one of these gods is real, then they'll, they'll cover for me. It's why they have this unknown god statue. Literally, the word unknown there is the word we have for agnosticism. Agnos means not knowing, unknown. Agnosticism is his belief. Yeah, God might exist. I don't know. I can never be sure. So I'll kind of half believe, half not believe. That the whole great many idols that they have show that they don't really truly believe seriously in any of these. In any of these idols. That there's a true emptiness of their faith. And so he addresses them, telling them, the God who made the world... Everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life, breath, and everything. He's saying, you see all these statues around us that I've seen throughout your whole city? The problem is, they're all made by human hands, aren't they? So what are they representations of? Can they actually do anything to help you in life? No, they've all come from wood and from stone. How can they do anything for you? Secondly, he's saying God doesn't live in a temple. God doesn't remain in one physical spot on the earth. And the Stoics would have said amen to that. They didn't believe that the God, the, the Logos life force stayed in a temple. But here's the big turn, he really says, and I think a really important turn for us, even as people who, if you've grown up in the church, for you to understand this, that God doesn't exist based on how well you serve him. God demands our service, demands our following him. But if we were to stop, he would not become weaker. He would not cease to exist. He doesn't live off of our sacrifice. He doesn't depend on us for existence. God is the only truly, the only self-existing being ever. God does not exist dependently on someone else. All of us crave independency, right? To be our own person, to make our own choices, to decide what I want to eat for breakfast, even if I do want to eat 
squash and ice cream and crab legs. True independence, right? But we were all truly dependent on someone. To even for our own existence, we needed our parents to come together to exist. That's not so with God. God didn't have to be fashioned by hands to come into existence. The thing about that, when you think about that temple to the un, that uh, altar, altar to an unknown God, it was likely there because it was from some prior tenant of Athens who had made some sort of altar, and they're like, well, if someone had worshipped a God here before, let's rebuild the altar. We don't know what God it was, so let's just say unknown God. Quite possibly, that God was just forgotten to all time, to all history. And because of that, once that God is forgotten, he ceases to exist, even in memory. Know this, that if we forget God or turn from him, rebel from him, he does not cease to exist. It's funny, so many of the, um, the new atheists, you know, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, a lot of their attacks on religion are just Christians are jerks. Which I think, you know, I think we should listen to. We shouldn't, you know, make a mockery of what, how God calls us to live. But they act as if that ad hominem argument of, well, the people who follow the Christian God are really mean deep down, so God doesn't exist. God does not exist dependently on how well we serve him. He still exists, even if we are in rebellion. He still exists. It's not an argument against his existence. And that's what Paul is saying. This God who created you, who gave you life and breath and everything, you don't know who he is, but that doesn't mean he didn't exist. I'm bringing to you the news of the only one who exists, and he indeed is close to each one of us. He is not far from us. And he calls them to confess all these things about him, confess that we are indeed his offspring, that if he created, to, created us and we are not self-existent people but dependent on him for existence, we must confess we are existing because he created us. And he, pr- he proves this by Greek poets of Epimenides and Erastus. In him we live and move and have our being, for we are indeed his offspring. A lot has been kind of made of this, this passage and how he quotes in the Greeks. But also notice who he doesn't quote from here. He's not quoting from the Old Testament. He's not quoting from Jewish writings. Now, is he like ignoring all biblical wisdom here? No, everything he's saying is based in passages like Psalm 9, where God says, I don't need your offerings to exist. He's, uh, the way he's mocking idols is very reminiscent of our confession of sin of Isaiah 44. He's speaking incredibly biblically, but he knows that his audience doesn't know the Psalms. His audience doesn't know Isaiah, so it doesn't do him good to, to cite chapter and verse. But he is quoting the wisdom of the poets and the prophets that they knew of how to connect with their context and their understanding that there is a kind of common grace in all peoples. That our, all of our hearts are searching, stumbling about, reaching out for him like a blind person in the dark, trying to find God. And now and again, God gives common grace to all people to understand some things that are indeed true about him. And it reveals that we are indeed his offspring because there's something about our creator who we bear his image that we can understand about him in small parts. Yet we have forgotten him completely. He kind of fully illustrate this too. Islam itself speaks of sin in terms of this kind of God forgetfulness. That sin is this, at its core, is this forgetting of who God is. And I think there's something true in that. And yet the tragedy of it is I do not believe that Islam can get us a full grasp on God because it doesn't see Jesus as the fullness of the deity there and the fullness of our forgiveness, and the fullness of how we can know God is by Jesus Christ. And so there can still be truth discovered on people who do not confess Jesus as their Savior. Those statements just illustrate how we are stumbling about trying to find God, and there are moments where we bump upon His truth, that all capital T truth, all truth is God's truth. That there is truth and philosophy and studies of sociology and studies of history and science. All these things are discovering truths that God put upon, into this world. 
But the sad irony of it is, of what we do as people, as we, as we stumble about trying to find our God that we have forgotten and who is still nearby, we might find truth that he has put in place and yet make idols of that which we've discovered. So often history or science, sociology and philosophy can teach us good and true things, but if we make idols of them as if that field of study gives us all the answers we will ever need, we have instead made an idol in the pursuit of trying to find the true God. All the presence of these idols reveal these things, how deeply we are searching for God and how deeply lost we are. It shows how deeply and how thoroughly and earnestly we've turned away from God, that we've made idols and industries for the purpose of worshiping things that are not God. How sad and how tragic that is. That, as I said, our nature before, our nature is to be a perpetual factory of idols. That is, we put these idols together in this factory, we might actually discover things that are true indeed. But if we worship those things we've discovered, we are just continuing to build those idols in that factory. But what it also shows is how deep down we are, each one of us, each person longing for someone to worship, longing for someone to serve, longing for someone to love us. It doesn't make all that false worship right, or it doesn't baptize it with holiness. But instead, it reveals this emptiness that we are trying to fill. This God that who is not far off, where is he? How can we find him again? Arthur Bruce Marshall once wrote, I still prefer to believe that sex is a substitute for religion. That the young man who rings the bell at the brothel is unconsciously looking for God. That even the person who is just trying to find sex as a way to fulfill and gratify and make themselves complete shows a brokenness and emptiness in them. That they've not found the answer at the bell of the brothel, certainly. They've not found that answer and still walking away from God's design for sex and for marriage. As they're walking away from God, they're still hungry for something. We're to be loved, to be, to be long, for faithfulness, for security. That all sin that we're doing, we are probably trying to find some way of worship and belonging. The problem with all sin is it's itself an idolatry of being distracted and pulled away from our God. God is not far from us. He's still nearby as we grope around and look in the dark. The full light of Jesus Christ reveals what truth is. So we must really confess the ignorance of idolatry. The total ignorance that... Though we uh, should seek God, perhaps feel our way toward him and find him, he is not far from each one of us. The problem with idols and sins drives us further away from God as we're searching for him, who's already near at hand because he has sent Jesus into the world. But if we are indeed God's offspring, how could we ever think then? If we were created by God and put in his image, why would we think that we could put his image in stone, or in wood, or in paper money, or in careers, or in our phones, or in our own image. Here's how offensive it is then, to worship and imagine those material, physical things are gods in themselves. As if those things can complete us and give us hope for our lives. Bowing down to dead things, things that our society has ascribed value to. If our hope is in money and success, that is an ever-inflating and deflating God. What an empty worship that is. Instead, we are to worship the living, the true God. These physical material goods are only going to drive us further away from that God. He says that in light of that, we must repent. That in previous times, God has overlooked ignorance, which means that in the Old Testament, he didn't send many old, uh, missionaries to, and many prophets to places like Greece. We saw Jonah go to Nineveh to be a missionary, but that was pretty much it. Idolatry before Jesus was certainly condemnable, but now that Jesus has arrived, that nearness of God has been proclaimed for all nations and all peoples, 
Idolatry is completely unexcusable, condemnable before, but now without any excuse. And we are now all called to repent, to return. Repentance, being able to realize and acknowledge this thing that I am worshiping and saying, this will be my fulfillment. Everything that we say, I am fulfilled if, once we do that and realize how empty it is, then we should turn from it. Repentance is a confessing the error and turning backwards from it, putting your back against it and saying no more. That is our call here. It's to repent, to confess the gods that we've put in our life, these idols we've placed in our life, the distractions, the things that we think will com- complete us. And if we lose that, if I lose that thing, God, no, don't take that away from me because then I'm incomplete. That is an idol, a false worship. What unknown God altars have you put up in your life that need to be repented of and turned from? Because when we turn fully from them and face the light of Jesus Christ, we can be sure, we are assured of life eternal. That Paul talks about this appointed man coming to judge. How the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to you all by raising him from the dead. It's interesting, Paul isn't explicit about the name of Jesus here. He wants them first to understand who God is and why we must follow this God he proclaims. And the whole, the whole emphasis of why should you believe what I'm saying, it all hinges on what? The resurrection. That we can know, he says, you know I'm telling the truth because this man, this appointed man who's coming again to judge, that's why you need to repent because judgment is coming. He raised from the dead. That he will come, he will judge in justice, but he will come to judge because God rose him from the dead. And it is at this moment of talking about resurrection, of death not being the end of the story, that he loses his audience completely. People all start to mock and laugh. There's probably chattered laughter as he talks about the resurrection. See, most Jews believed in the resurrection. Most Jews believed you'll die, but then God will raise up his people once again. Greeks, much like most people here today in our world, did not believe in that. Asaclis wrote, Once a man dies and the earth drinks up his blood, there is no resurrection. Literally, the same word that Paul is talking about, the Greeks believed there is none. Now, some Stoics may have, may have liked the idea of a continuing on of existence of the spirit of some kind, but not of resurrection. But what's amazing, he doesn't seem to lose everybody here. There are still some who return and say, tell us more about this another day. We want to hear more about this again. God might be the opening, the door of faith here in this context. Why is resurrection so important? Why is that such an assurance of our life? Why is what we celebrated two weeks ago something we still must continue to reflect on? Because if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we are just uh, belong in that pantheon of other gods. Christianity is just one more option to choose from. Jesus is just one more philosopher like Socrates who got in trouble for some of the things he taught. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, he is just a philosopher. But if he did, if death could not hold Jesus, then what does that say about who he is? It means he is God. He is the creator of life and the holder of death. That means if death cannot stop him, we should fear his judgment. If we have turned away from him and not followed him, this one who has conquered death and is coming to judge, that should put fear in our hearts. And it also means we should look to him for guidance on how to live if he cannot be held by death. And if he indeed is God, that means he deserves all worship. And we can't give worship to anyone else, any other thing, but him alone. That before the feet of Jesus, all idols just look like broken in pieces. Because he rose from the dead. We can know that and be assured of life. You know, this is folly to the world. Ignorance, it's foolishness. I was even talking with a young man in my study last week about the hope of the resurrection. We were talking about how hard that is to believe, right? Because it's, 
not biologically possible, right? When we die and the earth drinks up our blood, we often would say, like, we're not expecting graves to just open up again. That's why the Athenians mock, they scoff, they laugh. Yet new life, life after death, a life of a new body in the new heavens and the new earth is our hope that we are short of because Jesus has accomplished that and he is coming again to restore that for us. What is fascinating, I think, is as we think then why there are so many religions, is I think it reflects a human tendency that is in every single person. We want to reduce, I think, sometimes faith and religion to a simple one thing that you want. That we cannot reduce our Christian faith to community or moral guidance or as we see that all cultures seek those things of community, moral guidance, desperately and reverently seeking out some form of morality. We all revere and honor someone, be they a celebrity, a ruler, a wise person. It shows deep down we all hunger for something. How am I to live? Who am I to live in harmony with? Who do I revere and worship? We all people, all people are looking for that, some level or another. But what we can't do with the Christian faith is reduce it to any one of those things. And it's not just here to give us a moral code of how to live well on this earth. Christianity is not just a way to find friends and community on this earth. Christianity is not just a way to get a good spiritual high encounter on this earth. Christianity is all about the hope and the faith of the world to come. It's eschatological in that way. It's future-minded. And it's also that we can turn back to the Father we have forgotten. Reach out and believe in, in our Father who is near to us. Near to us because Jesus has come into the world and has revealed himself to us. That is the answer we have all been looking for. The answer to all our questions is found in Jesus Christ before us all along. So let us pray to him. Pray to our Father who is near at hand, our Savior, our Spirit. Let's pray.